Well, welcome those of you that are here, uh, that are in the house. Welcome those of you that are online. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us for Resurrection Sunday 2021. Uh, A third grade teacher was teaching her students about the resurrection. And she asked a question to her students. She said, what was the first thing that Jesus said after he came out of the tomb? Well, little Bethany was there, and little Bethany says, I know, I know. And the teacher called on Bethany and said, hey, Bethany, what was the first thing that Jesus said when he came out of the tomb that resurrection morning? Little Bethany slid her chair out, and she stood up and put her arms out and said, ta-da! <laughs> well, today certainly is a ta-da moment. It is the greatest event in the history of the world. Today, over one billion people will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was dead, who came back back alive again. An event that took place over 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Speaking about time, um, how many of you have ever been to Disney World? Anybody been to Disney World? Well, in Disney World, there's a place called Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland. Uh, How many of you would like to have someone living in Tomorrowland that could tell you events that are going to happen today? So if someone's living in Tomorrowland and they were going to say, hey, I just want to give you a heads up. This thing called COVID, I know you don't understand what COVID's going to to take place, but you need to buy toilet paper, okay? You just need to buy toilet paper and you buy a lot of masks. Okay, and you're going to say, what are you talking about? Or, or they could say, hey, I, I know that you're in that relationship, and I know that you're going to be out with your spouse or those cr- close friends, but don't, don't make that statement, okay? Just don't make that statement that you want to say. That statement's going to come out of your mouth, but you are going to spend days and weeks wishing that you hadn't made that statement. Or they could tell you, hey, make sure you buy this Bitcoin thing. I know this thing sounds crazy, but it's going to go to thousands of dollars, or a stock. If we knew what would happen tomorrow, it could take the sting out of today. Sting out of today. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to walk through, I'm going to set the scene of the resurrection. And what's challenging about preaching um, the, the, the resurrection is every year it's the same story. Jesus died, he was crucified, and he buried, and he rose again. And it's a story that I never get tired of telling because it is a truly epic and a remarkable, remarkable story. So we're going to talk about what happened with the disciples on Friday, what happened with the disciples on Saturday, and then what happened on that Sunday morning. Now, if you were to peer in the disciples that early Sunday morning, the early Sunday morning, the disciples are filled with mourning, they are filled with weeping, they're, they're, they're filled with uh, just confusion and despair, despair. And the reason is, is that, let me ask you a question. Have you, have you ever given your heart and your soul to something and it not work out? I mean, you give your all. I mean, the disciples, they left everything and they followed Jesus. They, 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 they left the city they loved. They left their friends. They, they followed Jesus. And, and, and he died. He died. And they loved Jesus. They loved being with Jesus. They, they, they had never experienced, when Jesus taught, they, they were literally in awe and wonder because he spoke with such authority, such conviction, that he was so captivating when Jesus spoke. He spoke and their hearts, literally, it says that their hearts burned among them when they heard Jesus speak to them. They've never heard someone speak with such wisdom. And oh, how Jesus loved them. They'd never been with someone that, with more love and grace and compassion. They were overwhelmed. They loved being with Jesus. They were in awe of him. Jesus changed their lives. Jesus changed their lives. And they, they're, they're recalling it Sunday morning. They're recalling that Friday, that good Friday. And you say, Eric, why is it good Friday? It's the day that Jesus died. Because it's the day that Jesus died to pay for our sins It's the day that Jesus conquered sin and he conquered the grave. And the the disciples, remember, they watched watched one of their own, one of the 12, Judas, betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. They watched those Roman soldiers carry Jesus off as they began to beat Jesus. Those Roman soldiers with those big fists and rings on their face began to beat his face in. They watched them spit on him and mock him. They watched the scourging. 
They watched the horrible crucifixion and they watched Jesus die. Mark's account says it this way. In Mark chapter 12, if you have your Bible, Mark chapter 16, it says this. Mark chapter 16 and verse 9. When Jesus rose on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him. Those are the disciples. And they were mourning. The disciples are mourning. And the disciples are weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that, that Mary Magdalene had seen him, they were overcome with joy. Is that what it says? No. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. Verse 12, afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them. These are two of the other disciples. In fact, we're going to spend a lot of our time today talking about these two disciples and their encounter with Jesus. While they, wa- they, were, while they were walking in the country, and they returned and reported it to the rest of the disciples, but they too were ecstatic that Jesus is alive. No, they too did not believe it either. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful that we get a chance to gather, and we get a chance to meet online, and we get a chance to celebrate the greatest event in the history of the world. Jesus, would you meet every single one of us right where we need to be met? Lord, you know what every one of us in this room needs to hear. And Lord, may we hear a word from you. May we encounter you. Jesus, you are welcome in this place. So do your work and speak to us. Stir our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Mary Magdalene runs to the disciples and said, Jesus is risen from the dead. But they don't believe it. They don't believe it. Get this. Jesus has risen from the dead, and they don't believe it. Mary Magdalene had seen Jesus alive. But the disciples, they are mourning, and the disciples are weeping, and they don't believe it. How many of you know that when you are in a painful place, how many of you know that when you are in a hurting place, Where you are in a place where you are overwhelmed, it can skew your perspective on things. Someone said we don't see things as they are, but we see things as we are. And so these disciples, they they just couldn't believe it because they're like, Eric, they they were like selling Mary Magdalene, it's just too good to be true. I mean, we were there, we watched them carry him off, we watched them, Jesus die a horrific death, we watched him crucified, dead, and buried, we watched it all, we watched them nail him to a cross, we watched them, him die on that cross, we watched them peel his body, dead and lifeless body, off of, that, off of that cross, and wrap him in grave clothes and put him in a tomb. And now you're saying he's alive? It's just too good to be true. And some of you, you're in Friday because Friday represents a day of pain. And it's just too good to be true. I mean, some of you are saying, Eric, it's just too good to be true that God could love me and that I don't have to carry the shame and guilt of my past anymore. That's just too good to be true that God could resurrect my marriage. It's just too good to be true that God could bring my wayward child that is far away back home again. Eric, it's just too good to be true that God would love me that much and I could spend all of eternity Enjoying him and celebrating everything that he is. Eric, I've just given up hope. Eric, I've thrown in the towel. Some of you may be thinking, Eric, it's just too good to be true, so why even try? Jesus is alive and you're still mourning and you're still weeping. See, the resurrection has happened, but it's not become a reality in your personal life. And my prayer is that the resurrection will move from simply being a historical event, a historical fact, to an everyday reality for you personally. But on the, on the side note, I mean, who would blame the disciples? Who would blame them? I mean, it was a hard weekend. I mean, that Friday they watched Jesus carried off and they watched him die a horrific death. And that Friday night they couldn't sleep because of what they saw. I mean, they couldn't probably even eat. They probably couldn't sleep. And then that Saturday morning, they wake up and they're just, it's just a cloud of bewilderment, a cloud of confusion. I mean, we thought, we, we, watched him, we watched him raise dead people. We watched him perform miracles. And now he's gone. He's dead. And Sundays he, Sunday he's alive. He's risen from the dead. 
but they don't know it. It's been a challenging three days. And they're thinking, it's just too good to be true. And you may be thinking, it's just too good to be true that God could move in my life. Because some of you have had Fridays. You've had Fridays. And some of you have had Saturdays. Days where you are hopeless and you've made it to Sunday. And after the resurrection, Sunday morning, Jesus comes along and he walks to, and he comes alongside of two other disciples. In Luke chapter 2, it, it, Luke explains it this way. Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 24. He asked them, this is Jesus, this is Sunday morning. He comes along two of the disciples. And Jesus asked them, he said, what are you discussing together as you're walking along? Now, you'll see this over and over and over again. Jesus is masterful because he asks questions. Because when you ask questions, you can get to the deeper issue. The, 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 these two, Jesus is saying, what are you guys talking about as you're walking along the road? And Jesus stood still, uh, they, they stood still and their faces are downcast. I mean, they're so depressed, they're so discouraged. One of them named Cleopas asked him, asked Jesus, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these last days? What does that mean? That means, in, in other historical passages, highlight this idea that Jesus was not crucified in some small back room event with just a few people. No, it was Passover week. Every hotel was filled. Every room was filled. Thousands and thousands of people in the city of Jerusalem watched Jesus go to the cross and suffer and die horribly. That's why there's more accounts written about the resurrection of Christ than any other event in the history of the world. Is there evidence? Are you kidding me? And so Jesus said what things, he asked them. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And listen to what they said. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all these people. The chief priest and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. So what does Friday represent? Friday represents deep pain, deep pain. I mean, many of the disciples, they left everything. They dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. I mean, they left their jobs and their cities. They left everything. They put all of their eggs in the Jesus basket, if you will. They put all of their chips in saying, we're going all in with Jesus. We're going all in. And how many of you know that when you put your all in something, you put your heart and your soul and you give everything that you've got and it doesn't turn out, there is deep disappointment, deep pain. When you build your life on a foundation and you look down and you quickly realize you start to see the cracks start to fold and it crumbles beneath your feet. This is where the disciples were. Disciples were followers of Jesus. This is what they were experiencing. Deep grief, grief, mourning, and loss. Some of you today are in Friday, and you feel like Friday has lasted forever. And you're in deep pain. I think of David Price, uh, who had back surgery, and they had to take big metal rods and put metal rods in his spine and big screws screwed into his bone and he couldn't take pain medication because it would lower his blood pressure. So around the clock for many, many days was in excruciating pain. Some of you are today, you're in physical pain. Physical pain. Some of you may be in emotional pain. Some of you may be in relational pain. And you're in relational pain because someone that you loved hurt you. They disappointed you. They let you down. And you put your Sunday's best on, and you put a smile on your face, but inwardly you are experiencing deep pain and hurt. You are downcast. You are overwhelmed. And you may ask the question, does Jesus understand what it's like to experience physical pain? Does Jesus get it? I want you to think about the physical pain that Jesus went through. If you, has anyone ever seen the movie The Passion of the Christ? It's an older movie the, by Mel Gibson. Oh, my goodness. The Roman soldiers would take Jesus, and they would they, they beat him. They put a bag over his head, and they beat him and said, Jesus, prophesy who, who is punching you. These big Roman soldier 
They ripped his beard out of his face. They took a crown of thorns, smashed it into his skull. Blood began to come down his head. They, began, they, they took what was called a, a cat of nine tails. Think of a cat with claws. It's a, 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 a whip with nine leather straps. And on the end of these leather straps was sharp bone and glass and rock. And it would dig into your muscles and into your, your skin. And then they would rip it and flesh would come flying his body was shredded from head to toe. His back was charaded. His muscles hung out and were cut. Most people, the Roman law was you couldn't whip someone more than 39 times because a lot of times they would die. They physically couldn't handle it. We sanitize Easter, but it was a bloody mess. It was a horrible event. In fact, most of us wouldn't have the stomach to look at Jesus on the cross the Bible says that Jesus' face was unrecognizable. Does Jesus understand pain? The nails in his hands, it would have gone about right here. A nail going in your hands and in your feet. And the way that the, 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 the intent of the crucifixion was to make you pain, was to in, just increase and magnify pain so that wicked people wouldn't want to be crucified. The only way to breathe was to pull up on the nails in your hands when with your feet, <gasps> catch your breath, and then you would go down and you couldn't breathe. And if they wanted to speed up the execution, they would break someone's legs so that they could no longer pull up to catch their breath. It was the most excruciating way to die. And Jesus went through all of that pain because he loves you this much. And at any moment, he could have come off that cross at any moment, he could have said enough. Some of you are here today and say, Eric, does, does, does Jesus understand the relational pain that, I, that I'm enduring? The relational pain that I've just experienced? Think about Jesus, one of his own disciples, betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. Judas, he'd been with Jesus. He'd never experienced love like Jesus. He pours, Jesus pours out his life, and then that very person, all he did was ever love him and care for him and speak truth to him, and he abandons Jesus. Think about the 72 disciples, and you're like, Eric, I thought there were 12. Well, there were 12, but if you read the Bible, you'll see there's 72 disciples, and then there was an inner 12 that got all the airtime. And then of the 12, he had three, Peter, James, and John. And one of the inner circle disciples, Peter, Denies Jesus, abandons Jesus, rejects that he even knows Jesus in Jesus' darkest moment. Not just once, and not just twice, but three times. Jesus knows what it's like to feel all alone and to feel abandoned. Jesus understands Friday, and Jesus lived through Friday so that you don't have to stay stuck in Friday. And at the end of the service, I'm going to invite you to invite Jesus into your Friday so that you can experience Sunday. And not only did they feel pain, the pain of Friday. Listen to what verse 21 says of Luke chapter 24. But we had hoped. We had hoped. We'd hoped that this was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They were living in Rome, which is, which is an evil and oppressive Empire that killed people for sport in the Colosseums. Evil. Oppression. And what's more, it's the third day since Jesus died. They knew the prophecies that Jesus foretold that he would raise three days later from the grave. They had hoped, and you say, Eric, what's hope? Hope is an expectation of a desired outcome. Hope is expectation of a desired outcome. Hopelessness is when your expectation and your experience, they don't line up. The disciples were hopeless. You expected the relationship to work out, and now the relationship is no more. I mean, you, you would hope you'd be further along in your career, and you're stuck at the ceiling, and you can't move beyond it, and you're saying, what's going on in all of this? I'd hoped that it would work out. I hoped that things would be different. Hopelessness is a massive issue. And I think over these last 12 months, loss of hope is 
destroying and impacting so many lives in America and around the world. Hopelessness. Here's the problem with hopelessness. Here's the problem with lack of joy in your life and lack of joy in my life. It can cause us to get comfortable in our dysfunction. It can cause us to lose the fight to move forward towards what is good and right and just. And it causes us, it can, hopelessness can cause us to settle into our dysfunction, saying it's okay. No, it's not. Rise up. To lose the fight for purpose, lose the fight for relationship, to throw in the towel. Saturday, Friday's a day of pain. Saturday is a day of a day without hope. Saturday is a day where your hopes die, your dreams die. Some of you feel like, God, where are you? And you've lost hope in God. And if you're honest, you're probably angry at God because you prayed and you had faith and God didn't do his part. So you think. Your expectation and your experience of God did not line up. And you're here this morning because someone invited you, but secretly you are angry at God. Because from your perspective, God didn't do what God should have done. Can anyone relate? But here's the problem with that. The problem with that is that God is outside of time. And God sees the beginning of your life to the end of your life at the same time. He sees it at the same time. You and I can only see linear. It's like a jigs, like a thousand piece puzzle. We can only see one piece of the puzzle. We can't see the entirety of it. In fact, we make our plans of what we're going to do next week and next month, but we don't even know what's going to happen this afternoon. But here's the good news. I do know who holds my tomorrow. Because God is outside of time. My whole life from the beginning of end, he sees it all. God knows what you and I need in this season that will prepare us for the next season because it's not just about this one singular event or this moment. Here's the problem. The problem is we want God to be on our time instead of God's time. Hey, God, where are you? I mean, come on, I prayed yesterday. Why, aren't you, why haven't you answered it? Where are you? Hurry up, God. Come on, come on. My time. Come on, God. But from our perspective, we can't see what God's doing. And because we can't see what God's doing, we think God is absent. We think God is AWOL, and he is not. I love Romans 8. It says this, and we know, or we have the confidence or assurance that in all things, God works. I'm so thankful that in all things God works. In all things God works for the good of those who love him who have, been, who have been called according to his purpose. And here's what I know. I know that my God is able. I know that my God is able. Hey, you may feel like you're hopeless. You may feel like you're discouraged. But my God is able to resurrect your situation. And I came this morning to remind someone that we serve a risen Christ and he is alive and he is sitting on his throne and this is Resurrection Sunday and I pray that that truth will seep deep into our hearts because some of us are sitting on Saturday and some of us are stuck in Friday but don't forget, Sunday's coming and that's the resurrection and God can take and bring something beautiful out of the bad things, out of the despairing, the difficult, the times of harshness, God can bring something beautiful out, out of that because God is the God of the turnaround. And I just want you to know this morning, God is working in your life like a recipe. He's cooking up something good. He's in the kitchen, even though you can't see him. He's in there, let's add a little of this, and let's add a little of this, and hang on there, hang on. I know you're in Saturday, but Sunday's coming. I'm cooking up something good. You gotta just trust me. Keep saying yes to God. Yes to God. God, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter. It's not about us. It's all about him. God, I give you my life. I'll do whatever you want when it doesn't make sense. I'm going to continue to say yes to you. And when you continue to say yes to our good God, good things will happen because he is a good God. Does it mean you won't suffer? Absolutely not. 
But God's just so good. He can take the suffering and the difficult things in your life, and he can weave and make something masterful and beautiful out of your life. If you will just keep saying yes to God, I don't understand it. It doesn't matter if I don't understand it. God, I'm all in with you. And even when I lose hope, I will remain hopeful because I know who holds my tomorrow. And he is the risen Christ. And he is good. He's working behind the scenes. Hey, it may be Friday, but Sunday's coming. And when Jesus walks along these two disciples in Luke chapter 24, listen to what happens. Early Sunday morning, Jesus sneaks up. These disciples are walking along. They're filled with discouragement. They're filled with despair. And Jesus begins to explain to them about the Old Testament prophecies in verse 26 of Luke 24. Did not the Messiah, Jesus is explaining to these, did not the Messiah, saying that I am the Messiah, have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. Hey, remember back in Genesis? Remember Genesis, and let's go to Isaiah, and let's go to this passage over here. He's foretelling all of the Old Testament prophecies. Look, I am the promised one. I'm the fulfillment of all of those. In verse 28, and as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going to go further. They actually, they're like, no, 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 we're going to stop in Youngsville. This is where our plan is, and Jesus is going to keep on walking. But they urged Jesus strongly, saying, stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. I love Jesus. He's masterful, masterful. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he broke it. He took a whole piece of loaf of bread and he broke it. And he gave them to the disciples and said, this is my body that is broken for you. They remember Jesus doing that at the, at the Last Supper. And when they, Jesus gave them the bread their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up immediately, and they returned at once to Jerusalem. They ran, and they found the 11 disciples, and those who were assembled together and they were saying, is it true? Is it true the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon? And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized, recognized by them when he broke the bread. If Friday was a day of pain and Saturday was a day of hopelessness, Sunday, Sunday was a day of freedom. See, the Last Supper, Jesus takes that bread and he breaks it and he says, hey guys, this is my body that is broken for you. See, his brokenness, because Jesus was broken, it allows them to not stay stuck in Saturday, a day of hopelessness. The same thing is true for us. Because of Jesus' broken body, you don't have to live hopeless. You don't have to live purposeless. You don't have to live stuck in your sin and in your shame. Did you know God doesn't want you to live carrying all of that emotional pain and emotional sin of your past? See, Sunday came so that you can be free of sin, so that you can be free of your shame, so that you can be free of the decisions that you have made in your past or of the decisions that other people have made on you that still impact your life today. Listen to this. Isaiah 55, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, Jesus, and by his wounds we are healed. Now why did Jesus go to the cross? He went to the cross to pay for our sins. And not just the sins of the world, but your sins. I love John 19. At the end, Jesus is at the cross. He's literally, he's going to die at this moment. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, Jesus bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Literally, he handed over his spirit. The original language, the original Greek in that is to give over at an appointed time. Jesus gave up his spirit 
to the Father. And then he went into the depths of the earth, and then he went into the depths of hell. Now, the Bible doesn't give a lot of description about all of that that took place, but here's Eric's thoughts. Let me just chase a rabbit with you. Here's what I think could happen. I think when Jesus, that second day or Friday, he went to hell, and he went to hell, and he took the keys from Satan of death, took the keys of hell and the grave, and he took the keys of hell so that you could escape that horrible place. And he took the keys of death because he is greater than the grave. And he, three days later, he kicked that grave open because he is the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in him will live even though he dies. And Jesus has been on a rescue mission. And he's coming for you because he loves you. And you know what he wants for you? He wants to give you freedom. Freedom. He wants to free you up from all the junk and the wrong decisions that you've made in your life. He wants you to find freedom. He wants you to know him. He wants you to discover your God-given purpose, and he wants you to step into it and step up because some of us are sitting down, and it's time to get up because this life is not all there is. And I'm going to, as long as I stand here, I'm going to call you up every Sunday because your life matters. And I know you're struck in life is discouraging and depressing, but rise up. He's risen from the grave. Resurrection power lives inside of you, and you have a new hope and a new purpose and a new mission, and that's to live and to glorify our risen Savior. And one day, when you stand before him face to face, and he says, what did you do with your life? you say, I'm so glad I didn't waste it. So don't waste your life, because we serve a risen Savior. And he is light, and he is life, and everything you're looking for is found in Jesus because he is the risen Savior. And he's on a rescue mission to rescue you and to set you free and to restore you and to love you and to give you a hope and a purpose. So rise up. Because he whom the Son sets free is free what? Free? One more time. He whom the Son sets free is free? Did you know there's a difference between between being free And being free indeed. Two men escape prison. Oh, they're free. They're free. Hey, they don't have the warden saying, eat at this time and go to this place and do this and do this. They're able to roam around. They're free. But they're always looking over their shoulder. They're always waiting for the consequences of their past to catch up to them. And at any moment, they know they will no longer be free. And some of you feel free, but you're not really free indeed. Because you're constantly looking over your shoulder, thinking that the decisions that you have made in your past are going to finally catch up with you. And you're secretly wondering, is that shame going to wash over me? Is that Shame and guilt going to overpower me? Is it going to overtake my life? And Jesus wants to set you free and free indeed. So that you don't have to live life no longer looking over your shoulder and wondering if God in heaven is going to take his lightning bolt and just zap you because of what you've done in your past. Because he whom the Son sets free, he's come to set you free free indeed. He's come this morning to say you don't have to carry that shame another second into your future because it can all be dealt with. It can all be forgiven. Say, Eric, how? You got to own it. Everybody say own it. Romans chapter 3, it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Ten Commandments, how many of those have we broken? All of them. How much do you have to steal to be a thief? One paper clip? One pencil? God doesn't care whether it's a million bucks or you steal one tiny thing. If you've stolen one thing, you're a thief. If you've hated someone wrongfully in your heart, you've committed murder. If you've looked with lust, you've committed adultery. Failing to put God first place in our life is sin. Honor your father and mother. We blew that a million times. There is none righteous, no, not one, and we all fall short of the glory of God. It's like, who's going to jump from here to the moon? Just jump. Some people might jump a little bit higher, but none of us are going to jump. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the, Romans 6.23 says this, for the wages of sin, singular, one sin. What wages mean payment. You work a job, you earn $10 an hour. The wages of sin, one sin, is death. And that means separation from God in a real place called hell. For the wages of sin is death. 
you got to get this. We are not just mistakers who make mistakes. We are sinners who sin. I don't care what society says. Let me just say this. You were never meant to go to hell. You were never meant to go to hell. Hell was intended for Satan who rebelled against God and a third of his angels that followed him that says, we want to be worshipped like God. And God kicked him out of heaven. And they're eternal beings. That's what Satan and hell was, orig- hell was originally intended for Satan and them. And you say, well, well, Eric, I could never serve a God who would send people to hell. He doesn't. People choose to go there, and they have to walk right past the cross of Jesus Christ with his arms wide open saying, whosoever will, whosoever will, let him come. You have to reject the love of God. You have to reject God's gift. You have to reject what Jesus did on the cross, saying, I don't care what Jesus did on the cross. I don't want Jesus. I'm going to get there on my own. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, this is Jesus. This is God's gift to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. This amazing gift is eternal life. And being good, being a religious person, no, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me say this. If your faith is in anything else than Jesus alone, then you should feel hopeless because you are still stuck in your sin. So what will you do with the gift? What will you do with Jesus? Today, I offer you the opportunity to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I'm not offering you church membership. I'm not offering you to be a, I'm not asking you to be a religious person. I'm not asking you to be a good person. I'm, a, I'm, gonna, I'm saying, what are you going to do with Jesus and what he did for you? And my prayer is that many of you that have never trusted Jesus, today will be the day that you accept him as your Lord and Savior. You finally say, God, I'm all in. Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. I give you my life. Would you forgive me of my sins? I know that I've sinned. I want to accept the gift of God. Maybe you're far from God. Maybe you've wandered from God. Maybe you're not far. Maybe you're just... I don't know. I don't know. Whatever God wants to do. And Lord, would you just bow your heads with me for a second? You can feel the Holy Spirit nudging you. You can feel the Holy Spirit working in your life. And he is calling you. He is, he's pursuing you. He wants to set you free. He wants you to go all in with Jesus. Will you say yes to him? Will you say yes?
Say yes, fine.